Hi folks, um, thank you so much for coming today. My name is Joy Yamaguchi. I'm the Public Program Supervisor at Janum, and I'm so grateful that you took some time out of your Saturday morning for this exciting um, first program of this new exhibition. I just wanna start with a few logistical notes. Um, you are free to use the Zoom chat. Let us know your thoughts and your um, comments on the program today. Um, and if you have any technical questions throughout, you can chat myself in the chat or any of the other technical team. Um, and with that, I'm gonna kick off this program, get us started already, and I'm gonna pass the mic over to Ann Burroughs, the president and CEO of Janum. Thank you, Joy. It's my, distinct, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the virtual opening of our newest exhibition, Sutra and Bible, Faith and the Japanese American Incarceration. We're so happy to be co-presenting this with USC's Shinso Ito Center, Japanese Religions and Culture. It's an extraordinary exhibition that tells the story of a community's journey, of a community's spiritual journey to survive. So from behind the confines of barbed wire and America's concentration camps, from locales that were under martial law through to the battlegrounds of Europe, Japanese Americans drew on their faith to survive that dark period of history. They used their faith to survive the dislocation, the forced removals, the unjust incarceration, the family separations, and the wartime conflict of that period. And it was at a time when their race and their religion were considered to be threats to national security. It's a story, the exhibition tells the story of how the Buddhist community and the Christian community were able to hold folks together during that experience, how they were able to teach compassion, how they were able to offer hope and resilience in a time of despair and anger and resistance. It's an extraordinary exhibition that tells those stories. It tells the stories of individual people and we do it by bringing those, we bring those stories to life by gathering together this amazing collection of artifacts, some of which have never been seen before. So please do visit us, visit us at Janum, visit us, come and, come and see the exhibition, which will be open until November the 27th, or visit us online at janum.org where you can learn more about the exhibition, the artifacts, the stories, the history about our curators. And I'm so happy to say that we have almost a thousand people who've registered for this virtual event. And I think that probably shatters Janum's all-time records for our virtual events. It's now a real pleasure for me to introduce our curators who will walk us through the virtual tour, our very eminent curators, Dr. Duncan Williams, who is an ordained Buddhist priest, and he's also the chair of USC's School of Religion and the director of the Shinso Ito Center, as well as Dr. Emily Anderson, who is one of our Janum staff curators, and she's an expert on modern Japan, Japanese Christianity, and the incarceration experience. So now I hand it over to Duncan and Emily to lead us through the tour. Thank you so much, Anne, for uh the wonderful opening, and it's certainly my uh, uh, pleasure and privilege uh, to serve along with Emily Anderson as one of the curators of this show. It's the first show on religion uh, here at the Japanese American National Museum, and one that uh, I think will do something to, to fill the gap of that lacunae here at the museum. You know, religion has been something that uh, we all know is important to Japanese American history prior to Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, all the way through uh, the war. It's something that uh, 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 somehow has been hidden from our sight, and we hope uh, the artifacts, the histories uh, that we tell in this exhibit uh, will, will shed light on this uh, uh, aspect of Japanese American uh, uh, life in general, uh, but also what happened during World War II. For me, probably one of the most uh, striking stories that I first learned about the importance of religion in the Japanese American experience, and especially during World War II, was when I learned maybe 20 years ago about the story of a young 10-year-old uh, at that time, uh, Masumi Kimura, 
who uh, was the wife of one of my graduate school advisors uh, back you know, two decades ago. And when she related to me her family's story uh, about the fact that her dad was uh, the president of the Madeira Buddhist Association and how he was visited a few uh, days after Pearl Harbor uh, uh, being questioned and interrogated about his role in the Buddhist uh, community as a leader um, and how the family uh, after that visit from the FBI, uh, went around the house and picked up everything they could find uh, that had Japanese characters on them, anything that had uh, made in Japan. And for her as a 10-year-old girl, the most kind of striking thing was that they took the Hinamatsuri Ningyo, the Girls' Day special dolls, and all of that put it into a fire to burn away. But her father did not burn everything. He found the the, the, the Buddhist scripture, the sutra that had been handed down over generations and put that in a box. He also, as the president of the uh, Buddhist Association, had the records, the temple records of all of that activity from its founding. And he put that in that box and buried it on their farm uh, as they went to the Fresno Assembly Center. That box uh, uh, was lost to history, to the soil of California. Uh, that family was never able to uh, come back and buy back their farm. And uh, somewhere in the soil of California lies Buddhist scriptures as well as Buddhist temple history. That kind of buried history, hidden uh, from view, is what we try to uncover and recover in this show. You know, I, I think in terms of how we think about religion and why religion mattered uh, for those people, Obviously, for that one family, they could burn away their Japanese-ness, but they couldn't burn away their faith. And uh, for us to understand uh, what the role of religion is, I want to talk to you today about six different ways, all words starting with the letter M. I'm sorry for the, it's a little bit simplistic, but the first word I want to talk to you about uh, that, 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 that describes how religion mattered is the, is the word map. Uh, in many ways, what this show is about a map for us to uh, navigate the terrain of Japanese American life, navigate the terrain of the inner life of people who uh, faced dislocation, faced incarceration, family separation, and unjust deportation. So it's a map because it orients us to ultimate truth. It's a map because it gives us directions towards what is morally upright. It's a map because it gives us the lay of the land of, of peoples that had to deal with uh, 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 decades of, of uh, 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 discrimination on the basis of race and religion. Uh, by Pearl Harbor, uh, the community was roughly uh, 75 or 80 percent Buddhist, uh, 20 to 25 percent Christian, with some percentage of, of, of those affiliated with Shinto. And in the 70 years of Japanese American history, religion played such an important role. It played that, that map to kind of navigate uh, uh, moving to a new land, moving to a place where they were searching for a home, a sense of belonging, when everything around them uh, the government, uh, the, the society at large, the media, uh, raise these ideas that uh, because of their race and national origin, as well as if, because the majority of the community was Buddhist, their religion, they were somehow not fully American, not welcome in America, and ultimately not only un-American, but anti-American, seen as a national security threat. And so when we start this exhibit, uh, we have a section that, uh, that uh, frames the beginning called the second dislocation. The first one being, of course, crossing the Pacific, trying to find their new home in America. But the second dislocation, uh, where after the roundup of, of, of uh, Buddhist priests being among the first of community leaders right after Pearl Harbor, and after Executive Order 9066 in February 1942, the forced removal of the entire community uh, that the second dislocation where people had to figure out you know, what to take to camp, uh, what to uh, think about their experience, uh, but from a, from a 
point of religion, uh, drawing on their faith, their community. Uh, that's what uh, I'd like to now turn to my co-curator, Emily Anderson, to talk about some of the important artifacts that we have uh, around that story. Thank you, Duncan. So, as Duncan mentioned, for the majority of the Japanese American community that was Buddhist, Buddhism had become an, a religion that was seen as suspect and that marked people as un-American and potentially disloyal. For those who were Christian, as much as some of them probably had hoped or assumed that their religious faith would protect them somehow, it turned out that race really trumped religion and that being Christian was no, um, didn't do any, anything to protect them. One of the things we really wanted to show with this exhibit was in this moment, in the, in the months between the attack on Pearl Harbor and as people were in slowly um, between Pearl Harbor and then through the spring, uh, taken first to assembly centers and then to concentration camps, what, what was going on for them? And this is a period that's very hard to um, find documentation for because people were often more concerned with trying to take care of things in the last moments, packing things up, um, disposing of important objects. But some of the things that we do have in the museum's collection that really poignantly show us what was happening are a set of sermons. Uh, these sermons were the sermons given by a number of Nisei ministers in uh, California. They were collected by the American Friends Service Committee, or the Quakers, with the intention of publishing them. Now, the Quakers in the 90s actually donated these sermons to the museum. And um, like Duncan, I also, starting about 20 years ago, had started thinking about an exhibit on religion. And for me, these sermons, discovering these sermons in our collection was that first moment. They're given many on the Easter before going to camp. And um, they show us the struggle of the community and the leaders to understand how to comfort each other, how to prepare each other for this moment, for the great unknown. One thing I'd like to mention is that we are very fortunate in, get, in having people associate with the same churches or descendants of some of these pastors actually read out portions that we've recorded from these sermons, which you can also hear in the gallery. Now, another thing I would like to highlight is this ledger. This is a ledger that just recorded the daily ongoings of a church in the Imperial Valley in uh, Southern California. And the very last entry is the, ent is the day before this community was taken um, actually directly to Poston. And it is all written in Japanese, but we will provide the translation for these pages. And you will see um, the very mundane sort of tasks that the pastor's wife here undertook before she went. Her husband had been picked up by the FBI and was not there to help her. Many of the temples and churches in the Japanese American community were important community institutions before the war. And during this period also served as storage areas, meeting points. And this trunk, which um, we have on loan from the Joe and Fukui families, was used to store belongings in the basement of the Japanese Union Church here in Little Tokyo. And you can see here, there's a sticker that says Fukui Family and Japanese Union Church that marks um, that moment. Now, um, of course, this is a very brief and hurried period that was then immediately followed by entering into the different concentration camps or internment camps. So now I will pass it back to my colleague, um, Duncan, who will take us there. So we've talking, uh, talked a little bit about the idea of religion as map, uh, but also the second uh, M word I want to introduce you to is religion in migration, in the forced removal, in moving from one uh, place, from one home to another. Religion plays an important role at three different levels in terms of teaching, uh, giving perspective to people, in terms of ritual, providing some sense of uh, ceremony, and in terms of community, uh, of finding fellowship uh, with each other. In thinking about that transition from map to migration, one of the most uh, striking uh, examples of 
uh, somebody who's able to think about terrain, think about the ways in which movement uh, can be reframed, think about the fact of forced relocation in a new and different way is Reverend Nyogen Senzaki. When he was picked up and put a uh, place like everybody else in these uh, temporary uh, uh, assembly centers, so-called uh, in the Santa Anita uh, uh, former racetrack, um, that was an important moment uh, for him to reflect on what was happening uh, as he was told that he was going to be put, uh, along with many others in that assembly center, in a camp in Wyoming called Heart Mountain. Uh, he wrote a poem then. Uh, in which he said, and this is the title of the poem, uh, Leaving Santa Anita. This morning, the winding train, like a big black snake, takes us as far as Wyoming. The current of Buddhist thought always runs eastward. This policy may support the tendency of the teaching. Who knows? Now, this poem written uh, uh, by Reverend Senzaki uh, is references an old Buddhist idea, one that after the Buddha died, uh, or right before he died, uh, as he was predicting his own uh, passing, he prophesied that although his physical uh, 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 you know, body would no longer be with us, that his teachings, the Dharma, would, would remain, and that it would inevitably move eastward. And in Japan, uh, Japanese Buddhists as early as the uh, 7th and 8th century talked about the eastward transmission of Buddhism from India through China and Korea to the J Japanese islands. But Reverend Senzaki in 1942 is referencing this in terms of his movement on this terrain further east from California to Wyoming, where he would set up a Buddhist temple, a Zen Buddhist center uh, in his own barracks that he called uh, uh, Tozen Zenkutsu, a Zen Buddhist hall for eastward transmission. And here, in this amazing illustration by uh, Estelle Ishigo from uh, the Heart Mountain uh, Foundation on loan, is a beautiful uh, picture and depiction of him uh, engaged in Buddhist teaching. One of the three main areas of teaching, ceremony, and community. He formed that in his own barrack that he called this hall of eastward uh, transmission. Now, again, in terms of ritual, in the very same camp, we may note this photo here. Uh, this is an example uh, from also from Heart Mountain uh, of a photo by uh, Bill Mombo. Uh, one of the few uh, remaining uh, Kodoch uh, Kodachrome photos, color photos of the period. Uh, but he managed to capture something amazing about how religion sustained people in that migration. Uh, in, the, in this camp, ceremony, ritual, marking sacred time became so important, uh, uh, as well as in many of the other camps. And this was because as a community, which was majority Buddhist, uh, having a moment to grapple with and reckon with loss. Uh, it was not only loss, of course, of their businesses, their farms, their educational opportunities, but in camp that first uh, year, they, so many people, the vulnerable, the very young, the very old, uh, passed away. And in the Buddhist tradition, it's called Nibong, the idea of the first obon, to take care of the people, to name them, to acknowledge them. And so we see people coming out in force to uh, mark that sacred time, recreate something that they had done before camp. And the last thing I'm going to mention is this drum. It was a drum that's also uh, being displayed for the very first time. Uh, off the islands of Hawaii uh, from the Nichiren uh, Buddhist mission. What we have is a drum that was taken into that camp, uh, one of the internment camps in Hawaii, uh, uh, where it was used at the first obon. And if you come to the, see the inscription, you can see they used it at the obon to sound the drum to be able to do uh, their way of respecting ancestors and those who came before them. I'd now like to turn to, back to Emily to talk a little bit more about these type of artifacts from within camp that people often hand made uh, to maintain their faith. 
Thanks, Duncan. So when all of these over 120,000 people eventually were incarcerated in both the WRA concentration camps as well as many internment camps that held um, the most of the Buddhist priests that were um, part of the community as well as a, a small number of Christian clergy. Once they were there, those who wanted to continue to practice their faith or who were really relying on their faith for sustenance, for resilience, they turned to either the things that they brought to camp with them. Um, we have some of those things on display as well that um, some of the um, families at the Mary Knoll here in uh, Little Tokyo brought into the camp, uh, into Mansonar with them, but also many people created new objects, both as an act of faith, where the creation was itself an act of faith and an act of celebration of their faith, but also as a way of sustaining their faith. And one thing um, here that we have is this beautiful, simple cross. This was made by Reverend Watanabe. Um, his sketch is also pictured here in front of the cross. The man on the left hand, or on the right, or <laughs> this side of um, the sketch is Reverend Watanabe. He was a minister in Hawaii, but was detained by the FBI and brought to the mainland. And in Santa Fe internment camp, he created this cross. Um, along in the same um, detention centers, uh, George Hoshida, who is the illustrator of these different sketches, captured him and this other um, fellow internee, as well as multiple um, different rituals, including an obon that was held at Santa Fe, um, in order to capture these, these moments, these sort of ephemeral moments as they happened in, um, in the space. Uh, not only did uh, ministers like Reverend Watanabe um, create objects that went along with their faith and their practice, but others um, sought sustenance from, from their faith and beliefs. For instance, this beautiful shrine. This is a um, Hachiman Daimyojin Shinto shrine that was created to go in the Thule Lake um, Segregation Center's Judo Dojo. And we have been very fortunate to borrow this from Nancy Kyoko Oda and her family. Her father was the um, teacher at that Judo Dojo, but he believed that part of Judo, the practice of Judo, was also a spiritual quality. And so he wanted this, the shrine was there within the dojo to help um, reinforce that idea of being spiritually centered as they practice this martial art. So I'm going to um, turn things back over to Duncan, who will um, share about more specifically religious objects. So we've talked about religion as map, religion in migration. The third M word I'm gonna introduce you to is religion as mirror. In the Buddhist tradition that I belong to, Soto Zen Buddhism, uh, our founder, Zen Master Dogen from the 13th century, uh, wrote a text called Tenzo Kyokun, Instructions to the Cook. It was about how to uh, act as the head cook in a Zen monastery. And in it, you find all, you know, typical kind of instructions around uh, not wasting ingredients and so forth. But the two things that he really emphasized was one, know what's in the kitchen inventory. Understand what ingredients you have available to you. And two, make a meal that is for not only the physical nourishment, but the spiritual nourishment of those others who are in training around you. Of course, this is a metaphor. He was really talking about one's own body and mind as the kitchen when we, one needs to look into, put up a mirror to, do meditation to really discover who you were. And when you do, you sometimes find that not every part of yourself, every ingredient, every aspect of yourself is uh, wonderful, but his idea was that if you uh, are a great Buddhist cook, you're able to take even mediocre ingredients and make something worthy uh, for others. That idea is at the heart of this section here, where people in camp took 
what they could find. We see in front of us here this amazing, beautiful shumidang, formal Buddhist altar installed in temples. This was installed in the Heart Mountain uh, concentration camp in the Buddhist church there. It was commissioned by Reverend Chikara Aso, and several of these beautiful, large-scale altars were created uh, by uh, a uh, uh, some members of a company called the Nishiura Construction Company. It was a company uh, that made uh, beautiful buildings before the war, like the San Jose Buddhist Temple. And it so happened that the two brothers who headed the company uh, were in Heart Mountain. Some of their employees were also there. And so they were able to make these intricate, beautiful, master craftsman, uh, attention to detail, recreation of these shumidan, which themselves represent the cosmos. It's as if the, uh, the, 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 uh, the craftsmen were able to recreate not only how they practiced uh, their faith before camp, but recreate the cosmos itself. It has beautiful details about lotus flowers and uh, heavenly worlds embedded in this amazing piece. What they did, though, was able to uh, take, just like Dogen was talking about, Ingredients such as found desert wood, wood from mess hall crates. Uh, uh, they were also able to get a few pieces of wood uh, from the outside uh, 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 transported in. That kind of uh, mixing of materials to try to make something beautiful. This is something also reflected here. Here we see a number of examples of more homemade, you know, less professional, uh, uh, Lee made uh, uh, artifacts, but are still so beautiful and moving, uh, handcrafted uh, in such a way using whatever uh, desert wood, uh, other kinds of uh, wood that they could find to carve uh, Buddha statues, uh, as well as home butsudan, or home Buddhist altars that people could have inside of their barracks. In the front, we have on loan from Soto, uh, uh, Zenshuji Soto Mission, uh, a few blocks from this uh, museum, a beautiful uh, statue uh, made, from, made by Morio Kino. There's an inscription on the back of the statue that says he made it on the anniversary of his time in Manzanar, uh, where he completed it on December 4th, 1943, the day of independence. And for him, the, the crafting of this Buddha statue uh, had something uh, not only to do with his time commemorating his time of incarceration, but also to do with his freedom. The idea of uh, July 4th as a day of independence and freedom uh, linked to the carving of the Buddha. We're now going to move to the heart of the show, Sutra and Bible. Although we sometimes know who made a Buddha statue or a, uh, uh, an altar uh, and what feelings went behind the making of them, one of the most uh, 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 beautiful and yet complicated uh, story of a religious artifact from camp uh, comes in this section, uh, which I'm calling mystery, another uh, kind of M word on religion. The religion is ultimately about mystery. It's ultimately about how our minds cannot grasp fully, cannot conceptualize fully uh, the ultimate, the sacred. And this mystery around these stones that were originally called the Heart Mountain Mystery Stones because people didn't know what they were uh, is something I'd like to talk about uh, for a moment. This a uh, set of stones right here, and if I could, we could zoom in on some of the uh, particular stones, uh, came out of the ground uh, right after the war uh, when, by accident, a operator of a uh, uh, grader uh, uh, by the Bureau of Land Management uh, kind of was trying to clear brush and so forth in the cemetery area of the Heart Mountain concentration camp when that grader, uh, uh, that, that machinery hit a oil drum that was buried in the ground. And out came these stones. And 
you know, that individual gave it to the uh, homesteader in the area, uh, the Bovi family, uh, which was the family that ultimately uh, uh, gave this, uh, these stones to the museum. What we've come to learn uh, since that time uh, is that through the work of Japanese uh, uh, Buddhist studies scholars, uh, Professor Mori and Mino and others, we've come to learn that these characters represent uh, a portion of the Lotus Sutra. Uh, one of the most important uh, scriptures in Japanese Buddhism. And we see up here a selection of a chapter of the sutra. And what they found was that there was a perfect match between uh, uh, these characters and a certain section of the Lotus Sutra. And once that was discovered, then there was this question of the mystery of who was behind the calligraphy and the writing of these stones. And here uh, we have uh, our best suggestion uh, that is based on scholarship uh, by these Japanese scholars that it was most likely Reverend uh, Murakita Nikkan, Nichikan. Uh, he was a Nichiren Buddhist priest here in Los Angeles before the war. Uh, he was repatriated to Japan during the war on the Griff's home. But prior to that, uh, he would have been the most likely person as a Nichiren Buddhist priest, which takes the Lotus Sutra as central to their uh, tradition, to have been able to um, have memorized and know the scripture, to have been able to uh, copy the scripture out. He was also the calligraphy uh, instructor uh, at the camp, and so he was most likely the one who either by himself or with his calligraphy students uh, marked out these stones. Now, the final comment I want to make about the idea of mystery and, and, and what these stones represent is the idea that in the Nichiren tradition, they've long had, from as far back as the medieval period in Japan, when they felt that the Dharma was at, at, at risk of dying out, they had this idea that they would copy scriptures, isseki ichiji, one stone, one character, and that they would bury either on stone or on paper scriptures into the ground into what was called kyozuka or sutra burial mounds, with this idea that in a better time, in a future time, there would be one day when the world could practice uh, the values of Buddhism uh, uh, better. And that until that time, the sutra would be hidden, buried, and uh, uh, kind of uh, put underground with this prayer of a better time. And so for us uh, here at the museum uh, uh, with this exhibit, I think uh, these stones uh, represent an uh, important prayer that was uh, buried, that have now come to light. And we certainly would like to have you come and take a look at these uh, uh, our sutra stones uh, as they have themselves a kind of teaching uh, for us today. Now I'd like to turn to Emily to talk about the second half of the show. Uh, it's title, Sutra and Bible, the Kitaji Bible. So in the Christian tradition, like in the Buddhist, in the different Buddhist traditions that Duncan is referring to, scripture, the Bible, the word, um, as it's also often referred to, is, is critical. And um, the Bibles, we have many Bibles in this exhibit, but the one that we feature in this section as the, the, the main, the sort of the key Bible is this Bible that is a bilingual Bible created by Captain Masuo Kitaji, who was a Salvation Army officer in um, the Bay Area before the war. He was incarcerated at post and concentration camp. But before the war, he had already started the process of creating this bilingual Bible. As you can see, here, half of it is a regular printed version of a King James um, translation, an English translation of the Bible, but on the opposite page, he wrote in by hand the Japanese translation of the Bible, also including commentary and also illustrations. This Bible reflects not only his own personal devotion and um, it's sort of an act of meditation through uh, copying scripture daily. Um, he would apparently wake up at five in the morning to begin this process every day. But it also reflects his dedication to his community. He wanted to create a bilingual Bible that he could use as part of his ministry to Japanese speaking and English speaking Japanese Americans. And he wanted one Bible that he could use um, to reach out to both communities. His 
this Bible and a second Bible, which he created after the war when he was at um, Gilroy Yamato Hot Springs, are both on display at the museum. These um, are amazing objects, and like the Heart Mountain Stones, they also almost were lost to history. They were, um, what, what became of them after he passed away is not really clear, um, but they suddenly appeared in a recycling bin and were even in danger of being auctioned off. Um, but news of this upcoming auction um, reached members of the Japanese American community who had bec become um, invested in stopping auctions that sold parts of their own history. And so uh, an arrangement was reached between uh, family members of Captain Kitaji, of his descendants, and um, eventually these were donated to the Hoover Institution um, Library and Archives, which um, has allowed us to display them here for the first time. Um, obviously with uh, something like a book, um, when we display the object, we can only show one spread, page spread at a time. So we also are featuring these um, illustrations up here, some of the illustrations from the two Bibles, so you can get a sense of what this looks like. Uh, it is really, it's truly incredible the amount of effort and dedication. And once you get into some of the details, you see his, his grappling with theology, with doctrine, and trying to really work out for himself what he believed. Um, but it always came back to the word. Um, there's a, a very well-known passage in the Psalms, thy word is a light unto my feet, that um, he seemed to use as sort of his mantra. He wrote it in the front papers of this Bible. He also wrote it in the dedication um, page of a, of a New Testament um, edition that he gave to a family friend. And so here, this Bible completed in Poston is a representation of the value and importance of uh, meditating on and sharing the word. Um, Captain Kitaji is here on the day that he completed that first Bible in Poston. In addition to this incredible um, Bible and its sister Bible that was made after the war, we also are sharing a range of materials that every day uh, people of faith in the camps used. They're um, Gotha books, um, Sutra books, Sunday school texts, different Bibles. But one I really want to feature today is this particular one. It's a very small Bible, um, but it belonged to Charles Mitsuji Furuta. And um, this is him pictured here. And the Bible um, features a picture of his wife. He was picked up by the FBI um, from Wintersburg, where he lived, and um, was detained in a number of facilities, starting with Tuna Canyon, until he was eventually um, reunited with his family. But this Bible was one of the few objects that he carried with him. And in it, um, although we show the page with his wife, throughout this Bible, he records where he was. So you can see what pages of scripture he was reading as he was in Tuna Canyon, in Lordsburg, and as he eventually reached his family. And um, we're very fortunate to have this Bible on loan to us um, from the Furuta family. And I also want to just mention, we, you know, we know that the Wintersburg um, historic manse um, was lost in a fire yesterday, and the Furuta family was a very integral part of that story. Um, but we're very fortunate to be able to share this Bible and the story behind the Bible as part of this exhibit. So we now move into a section of the exhibit uh, uh, around not just what happened in camp, but what happened on the battlefields in Europe and the Pacific uh, Theater. I think many of you know that uh, the Japanese Americans who served uh, in the US military, either as volunteers or as draftees, uh, as part of a segregated unit, the 100th and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team on the European Theater, or uh, in the uh, military intelligence service in uh, the Pacific Theater, uh, that that story is quite well known. But perhaps what is not as well known is how religion mattered uh, uh, for those who served. 
uh, you know, this is the section I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, religion and all these M words. This is, I, I would call religion as a magnifier. It can zoom in or zoom out on what is important. And it's often said that in a foxhole, there are no atheists. And it's because uh, that moment of thinking about life and death, of being able to uh, make those uh, 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 mental adjustments to seeing uh, somebody uh, die on the battlefield, uh, of, of parents behind barbed wire in camps trying to deal with the loss of their child. These are the moments where uh, uh, things came into focus as to what was really uh, important, not only for an individual, a family, but a, a nation as well. And in terms of military service and religion, one of the things that uh, we might note uh, is the importance of uh, chaplains, uh, that they were uh, critical to uh, helping those who passed away, performing last rites. Uh, people brought uh, uh, with them, uh, in addition to the uh, 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 turning to the chaplains, they turned to uh, small uh, military-issued uh, uh, Bibles. They took their uh, Buddhist uh, prayer beads. But among the things that uh, 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 many uh, soldiers uh, uh, really feared uh, the most was that they would receive the appropriate last rites uh, at death. And at that time, uh, on a, a, a dog tag, it was indicated what type of religious service would be necessary based on what kind of religious affiliation uh, you would have. And so over here you can see uh, the dog tags with the letter P uh, for Protestant of uh, George uh, and Calvin Saito, uh, who were uh, uh, Christian. Uh, but, but over on the other case, you can also see uh, a, a dog tag that's uh, uh, rather unique. It says, I am Buddhist. And this is because at that time, uh, in the US military, the only uh, recognized religions were P for Protestant, C for Catholic, H for Hebrew or Jewish, and X for nothing. And uh, when uh, Buddhist soldiers who comp comprised the uh, vast majority of those who served in Europe as well as in the Pacific uh, needed to uh, uh, indicate that they were Buddhist, uh, sometimes they made this kind of supplemental uh, uh, dog tag. And once people learned uh, of these deaths uh, in camp, Again, this is about magnifying or zooming in or zooming out. And when we see photos like this of what appears to be just a Buddhist ceremony, uh, uh, it's a Shingon Buddhist ceremony in Minidoka, uh, where you can see the two mandalas up and Kobo Daishi in the middle. But when you zoom in closely, you can see the faces and pictures of the Nisei soldiers who lost their lives in Minidoka that is being memorialized. Or if we look at this photo, what, we, what do we see? We see three Buddhist priests uh, in front also of uh, Nisei soldiers' photos uh, who were uh, in, uh, passed away uh, out of the Rower concentration camp in Arkansas. And what we see are American flags as well as flowers that are made, artificial ones, uh, uh, out of like origami or folded uh, paper uh, by uh, the community itself, a merging of this idea of American Ness and American belonging, American service to the nation, uh, and proper uh, ritualization that could happen in camp if it couldn't happen on the battlefield because there were no Buddhist uh, chaplains. In line with that type of memorialization, one of the most important artifacts we also have on display uh, in this exhibit uh, is something I'm going to turn to my colleague uh, Emily Anderson to explain, the Amachi Ireto and Memorial Wall. Thanks, Duncan. So as Duncan mentioned, this, this act of memorializing or honoring those who were lost, both um, those killed in action, those Nisei soldiers who were killed in action, but also the many Issei and even some Nisei who passed away while they were incarcerated. Um, honoring them was a very important um, act for those in the camps, not just in the camps, but as they were leaving. And the Amachi Memorial Wall, or Ireto, this, um, which you see here in this photograph, was um, created partly with the help of Reverend Masahiko Wada, a Baptist minister who was uh, incarcerated there with his family. And uh, he wrote the, did the calligraphy for the stone 
um, monument. And for this community, what they wanted to do, as is explained in the wooden um, panels behind that appear both in the photo, but also we, we have the actual panels here on display. They explain that they are putting this here, not at the beginning or the middle of their incarceration, but actually as they're leaving, they wanted to honor the memory of those who've been lost in this community. Um, and part of this is you know, not wanting to leave anybody behind and not wanting anybody, um, anybody to be forgotten, to be a forgotten spirit. And um, in this wall, they um, list first on the very top those soldiers who were killed in action. And um, this being Amachi, this included um, Calvin and George Saito, two brothers who were killed very close to each other. Um, in Europe, as well as Kiyoshi Muranaga, who eventually was upgraded to a Medal of Honor in 2000. Um, and of course, the, the act for which he was honored with that medal was what led to his death. Um, but not only, um, he, so the top row of this memorial includes the list of soldiers, but after that, it begins the list of those Issei who were lost and um, they, their names are recorded along with the prefectures that they were born in so that that connection to home is still recorded. And amongst those, you will see also mention of Beikoku or America so that we know that those are Nisei who also died. Um, there are many babies born um, who did not survive in camp um, as well as other, other Nisei. But this is a testament to the de desire of this community to remember and honor um, their, those who left them um, and those who were, who were lost uh, during this experience, but to make sure that they were not forgotten. Um, there, were, there was another very profound act similar to this one that happened um, in Hawaii, which um, Duncan will describe. So I'm going to uh, pass things back to Duncan and um, he will pick things up from there. As one of the most important uh, uh, artifacts that we have from Hawaii as well uh, are these memorial tablets, these Buddhist uh, toba, sometimes called sotoba or toba, uh, after uh, the Japanese way of pronouncing stupa, uh, or a memorial uh, that originally housed the relics of the Buddha, they come often in these five tiers. It's called the Gorinto, the five tiers of a Buddhist stupa. And so you see in these memorial tablets five kind of notches at the top end of uh, this tablet. These were handwritten uh, by the only Issei Buddhist priest uh, that wasn't uh, picked up by the FBI on the islands of Hawaii, Reverend uh, Mitsumio Totori. He was serving at the Haleewa uh, Shingon Mission, and uh, uh, because of his friendship with uh, 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 the FBI uh, director of, uh, of, of the islands, as well as his elderly age, uh, they didn't pick him up, and he felt this responsibility to, to uh, do something for those uh, from the Hawaiian Islands who served in the, in the 100th, the 442, and the MIS. And every time uh, uh, an individual's uh, death was announced, uh, he wrote these tablets, giving them a Buddhist uh, posthumous name, uh, a name, uh, for example, on the very first one that he gave in 1943 in September uh, for Shigeo Joe Takata. Uh, he gave him a very unique Buddhist uh, posthumous name on his tablet, Yumong Ying, Chuse Hokuk Koji, which translates to, for the sake of America, he gave his life. This kind of uh, uh, archetypal Buddhist uh, memorialization practice and this idea of service to the nation. Uh, he, he, he did this uh, regardless of, of, of religious affiliation. He, he focused on uh, the ways in which uh, everyone, Christians included, would be honored and memorialized and not forgotten. And that's the final theme we have for this exhibit, the idea that uh, you're not alone. Um, I mentioned a number of M words in this thing. The last one is magnet, that religion is in some sense a magnet. On the one hand, it has the power to repel. 
It has the power to be divisive, has the power because of its uh, attention to ultimate uh, matters and, and deeply personally held convictions. It can divide people, but it also has the power to draw people together. And this is the last section called Solidarity and Reparations that we have in this exhibit that, that highlights the power of religion to draw people together, sometimes together beyond different kind of racial and ethnic communities, and sometimes beyond any one particular lineage or denomination of religion. And among the examples we have of that kind of action, of people who, despite being unpopular at the time, uh, being able to be in solidarity with the Japanese American community. Uh, we have on display many artifacts from uh, mainline Protestant, but especially uh, the Quaker and the American Friends Service Committee and their work in supporting the Japanese Americans uh, from uh, the earliest of times of the forced relocation and incarceration all the way through to relocating and helping uh, with, uh, placement in colleges, uh, placement in employment uh, possibilities in the so-called uh, free zones. We also feature uh, this picture of the blue bus, a, uh, uh, a bus that uh, was uh, put together uh, at the Seattle uh, Japanese Baptist Church, a bus that represented uh, uh, a, co a continued uh, support for the Japanese American community by Reverend Emery Andrews, a Baptist minister who made 56 round trips on that bus between Seattle and uh, uh, Minidoka, where he had actually relocated his family. That kind of idea of doing things that are right, uh, even when it's not popular. Uh, he, many Buddhist teachers who uh, were of uh, non-Japanese background who helped Japanese Americans, uh, they often found themselves derided as Jap lovers and aiding the enemy. And yet they found courage to uh, draw on their faith to do what was right. And this final uh, photograph we have here of Reverend Bunyu Fujimura, who also drew on that idea uh, of, of, of uh, going beyond uh, race, going beyond uh, uh, time to uh, continue to serve the community by repairing it, by engaging in uh, his testimony uh, for the commission. Uh, when uh, the, in the 1980s, the, the Japanese American community was seeking redress and reparation, uh, finding ways to uh, talk about uh, connecting the Japanese American experience with the black American experience. Uh, Reverend, uh, when you come to this show, you'll also hear people like Reverend uh, Kyoshiro Tokunaga, who talked about his relationship with the African American community, uh, his uh, uh, deep belief in the idea that the purpose of religion was to heal, the purpose of religion was to repair what he called the karma of the nation. And so in this show, I think what we find is so many different ways in which people gave perspective from a religious vantage point, found courage to stand up for what was right, found perspective in, in, in uh, their faith tradition, found rituals that would help them. And with that, I'm going to turn to Emily to uh, uh, conclude our, our presentation. So I just want to thank you again for joining us this morning, um, if you're here on the West Coast or whatever time zone you're in. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has been an exhibit that's been um, a very long time in the making. I think for Duncan and I both, we've had little bits of ideas about this for um, 20 years. And this is the fruition of a long, the long journey of research, of study, of reflection, of being inspired, um, of being challenged. And so we invite you to come to the museum. We are open to the public again. And um, this exhibit will be open to the public in just a few minutes. So if you are in the Los Angeles area and you have a free afternoon, we hope you will come down to Janum and join us on our first day open to the public. We will be open, this exhibit will be up through uh, November 27th of this year. So you have time. If you can't come today, you can come another day. But we do hope that you'll come. We shared some of our favorite um, and most important objects today. But obviously, it was just, just um, 
a taste of the entire exhibit. There's so much more and um, so many more things that I think um, are really powerful and um, very exciting for us to share with you. And maybe just to add a brief note on top of what Emily just said in terms of what is missing, we have a companion volume, a publication uh, that was published uh, by Kaya Press that uh, captures the all the artifacts in this uh, exhibit, but also many more that we didn't get to talk about today and some that are not even in this show. Uh, it's a beautifully designed book. Uh, I believe on your screen you'll see some information on how to uh, purchase a copy of it. If you come to the museum, please do visit the museum uh, store to, uh, to, to pick up a copy or otherwise uh, 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 order it online in the address that you see on your screen. It's got some beautiful uh, contributor essays, uh, 30 people beyond yeah. the two of us, uh, uh, wonderful people connected to the artifacts. And so uh, we urge you to come and uh, see the show, see uh, the book, uh, and maybe just one last thing uh, as we close out uh, today's program is this uh, wall of Toba behind us. These were written uh, in hand by the abbot of the Soto Zen, uh, mission of Zen Shuji a few blocks from here, Reverend Shimio Kojima. We believe it's the first time that this is not honoring individuals, but honoring all of the different camps, all of the WRA camps, Army Department of Justice camps, in both English and Japanese. You can see, for example, Manzana, Manzana in the Japanese way, or Tureko, Tule Lake, Ko is lake in Japanese. And finally, Santa Fe. In Japanese, some means hurt, to be uh, uh, injured, hurt in a dismal situation. Ta means a lot of, and Fui means sudden or abrupt. The internees themselves created names for their experience. A sudden lot of hurt. And this exhibit is our way of trying to redress that of finding a way to see wisdom in many of the artifacts, something that they teach us. We see compassion in how they found a community with each other. And we also see freedom. They're yearning for something beyond. And I think that's the power of religion. And we really hope you'll come and see this show. And uh, the doors, I believe, are open now. Thank you. <laughs>